he was tortured. And under this torture, he began to interpret Qutb's theories in a far more radical way. The mystery for... I, I like the idea of somebody literally being tortured, whipped and so on, and then in their mind reinterpreting theories. It's kind of an interesting, <laughs> kind of an interesting idea. Zawahiri <laughs> was why the Egyptian people had failed to see the truth and rise up. It must be because the infection of selfish individualism had gone so deep into people's minds that they were now as corrupted as their leaders. And Zawahiri now seized on a terrible ambiguity in Qutb's argument. It wasn't just leaders like Sadat who were no longer real Muslims. It was the people themselves. And Zawahiri believed that this meant that they too could legitimately be killed. <laughs> okay, this is getting a bit psycho now. Um... But such killing, Zawahiri believed, would have a noble purpose because of the fear and the terror that it would create in the minds of ordinary Muslims. It Pause. would shock them into seeing reality. But, but in a sense, this is where we're at with, um, as we as as being acknowledged by lots of people recently, with with the left in America, it's it's now okay to kill your enemies. You know, it, it's the same parallel with the left. Yes. You know, the disappointment at the masses not rising up, infiltrating the institutions, trying to radicalize people, and and to some extent succeeding towards driving them towards violence. Yeah, very interesting parallel. In a different way, they would then see the truth. Ayman Zawahiri came to the conclusion that because you have what you believe to be a sublime objective, then the means can be as ugly as they can get. You can kill as many people as you wish because the end means is noble. The logic you see, this is where me and Rachel Ghoul part ways. I'm not up for the killing of innocents in this manner. I mean, that could just be an NYU gender studies professor sitting there saying yeah. that at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That is true. ...is that we are the vanguards. We are the correct Muslims. Everybody else is wrong. Not only wrong, but everybody else is not a Muslim. And the only means available to us today is just to kill our way Oh, fuck it. I mean, this is the wrong lesson. The lesson is not <laughs> kill the masses because they didn't rise up. It is you. They've got to be led. You've got to actually become the leader and sway the crowd, it's not like a, open fire on the crowd. It's like an Amanda Yunucci show, isn't it? You know, it, it's quite a hard sell. Um, in order to help you, we have to kill you. <laughs> Action. I am going. And at this very same moment, religion was being mobilized politically in America, but for a very different purpose. And those encouraging this were the neoconservatives. Many neoconservatives had become advisors to the presidential campaign of Ronald Reagan. And as they became more involved with the Republican Party, they had forged an alliance with the religious wing of the party, because it shared their aim of the moral regeneration of America. The notion that a purely secular society can cope with all of the terrible pathologies that now uh, affect our society, I think is, has turned out to be false, and that has made me culturally conservative. I mean, I really think religion has a role now to play in redeeming the country. And liberalism is not prepared to give religion a role. Conservatism is, but it doesn't know how to do it. By the late 70s, there were millions of... That's, I mean, that's a very uh, non-religious idea of how religion should be employed for power, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Very yeah, it's just a <laughs> kind of dark. And here we have like stadium, stadium Christianity. Yeah. Truly, I mean, imagine ever I could see this. This is uh, religion, religion truly for the masses. And I just picked up on a second ago when he said that neocons had been uh, become advisors to Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign. Why? Why? Why, why were they hired? Why were they brought in? Who, yeah. who did that? Mm. Strange. Well, you could argue that they put him in power in the first place. 
I mean, it may just be a case that they are, in fact, just lobbyists for various manufacturing firms, um, sort of ideological uh, employees for that, you know, because they do obviously constantly justify ever more spending on the military. Um, I always think that's probably a, a part of the neocon thing, plus their own ideas, you know. Well, that's, that's the sort of, again, referring to Oliver Stone, that's the idea that emerges in films like JFK, you know, in the early 90s, despite the fact it's about the 60s, about the president being a cipher and just a broker for the yeah. uh, military industrial complex. Do they put on entertainment at these mega churches or is it literally just like guys, guys preaching? Like, is there um, also like a Punch and Judy show or a warm up man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wrestling match Stuart, Stuart Lee comes on. Talks about the or is it just sermonizing? I mean, uh, I think the entertainment is how silly everyone gets. Oh, I see. Talking and speaking in tongues. Ecstasy, rapture. Yeah. Well, they, they do the faith feelings of these things. Mm. The kind of because uh, they do the um, they do the shaky cell leg, which is also something they do in wrestling. You know, when somebody's hit so hard that their legs start start shaking, <laughs> they also do that in faith feelings, don't they? Where, where, they, where the legs... That, that the song, there. actually, uh, Roses Never Fade, that was sung by the man in the cowboy hat at the beginning, is actually a, jo a song by Jimmy Swaggart, the preacher. He actually wrote it. Fundamentalist Christians in America. But their preachers had always told them not to vote. It would mean compromising with a doomed and immoral society. But the neoconservatives and their new Republican allies made an alliance with a number of powerful preachers who told their followers to become involved in politics for the first time. I'm sick and tired of hearing about all of the radicals and the perverts and the liberals and the leftists and the communists coming out of the closets. It's time for God's people to come out of the closets, out of the churches and change America. We must do it. I mean, this is this is literally Aaron McIntyre, Simon. Just, yeah. just kind of toned down in. I like hearing the words "the perverts" and "the liberals" in one sentence. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm guessing there was also like a lot of you know Christian Zionism being preached here as well. He doesn't mention it, but I mean it would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, very much so. The Schofield Bible and all that, you know. Yeah. The conservative movement up to that point was essentially an intellectual movement. Uh, it had some very powerful thinkers, but it didn't have many troops. And uh, as uh, Stalin said of the Pope, where are his divisions? Well, we didn't have many divisions. When these folks became active, all of a sudden, the conservative movement had lots of divisions. We were able to move literally millions of people. And this is something that uh, we had no ability to do prior to that time. Literally millions. Literally millions. <laughs> And at the beginning of 1981, Ronald Reagan took power in America. The religious vote was crucial in his election because many millions of fundamentalists voted for the first time. And as they had hoped, many neoconservatives were given power in the new administration. Paul Wolfowitz became head of the State Department policy staff. While his close So is Paul Wolfowitz a uh, fundamentalist Christian? No. How does that work then? Oh, anyway, let's, let's carry no, on. Yeah, that, that's a big unanswered question by Curtis, really. Friend Richard Pearl became the Assistant Secretary of Defence. And the head of Team B, Richard Pipes, became one of Reagan's chief advisors. Is Richard Pipes a fundamentalist Christian? <laughs> yeah, this is just why, why, why? What, what happened there? Why is Curtis not looking into it? The, the, the Curtis of the Gaps, we could call it. The Curtis Indeed. of the Gaps. The neoconservatives believe that they now have the chance to implement their vision of America's revolutionary destiny. To use the country's power aggressively as a force for good in the world in an epic battle to defeat the Soviet Union. It was a vision that they shared with millions of their new religious allies take a personal and public stand as a, as a minister, a stand against communism, to destroy it, to wipe it from the face of the earth, because believe you me, these people are dedicated to the destruction of the United States of America and freedom as we know it. 
But the neoconservatives faced immense opposition to this new policy. It came not just from the bureaucracies in Congress, but from the president himself. Reagan was convinced that the Soviet Union was an evil force, but he still believed that he could negotiate with them to end the Cold War. Reagan didn't at first quite understand that the aggressiveness is rooted in the system. He, uh, he had a rather benign view of human beings. He was a very kindly man, and he attributed kind motives to others. There was another form of mirror imaging. And he would say more than one occasion, if, something like this, if I could just sit down with the Soviet leaders and explain to them that they're following a wrong ideology, and they adopt the right ideology, they could make the people happy and prosperous. So he said, Mr. President, that is not going to do it. You have to go after the system, force them to reform the system. It took him a very long time to assimilate this view. To persuade the president, the neoconservatives set out to prove that the Soviet threat was far greater than anyone, even Team B, had previously shown. They would demonstrate that the majority of terrorism and revolutionary movements around the world were actually part of a secret network coordinated by Moscow to take over the world. The main proponent of this theory was a leading neoconservative who was the special advisor to the Secretary of State. His name was Michael Ledeen, and he had been influenced by a best-selling book called The Terror Network. It alleged that terrorism was not the fragmented phenomenon that it appeared to be. In reality, all terrorist groups, from the PLO to the bader meinhof group in Germany and the Provisional IRA, all of them were a part of a coordinated strategy of terror run by the Soviet Union. But the CIA completely disagreed. They said this was just another neoconservative fantasy. CIA denied it. They tried to convince people that we were... Was, uh, was Michael Ledeen a fundamentalist Christian? Oh, you bet. <laughs> really crazy. I mean, they, they never believed... They never believed that the Soviet Union was a driving force in the international terror network. They always wanted to believe that terrorist organizations were just what they said they were, local groups trying to avenge terrible evils done to them or trying to rectify uh, terrible social conditions or things like that. I mean, CIA really did buy into the rhetoric. I, I don't know what their motive was. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know what people's motives are, hardly ever. And I don't much worry about motives. But the neoconservatives had a powerful ally. He was William Casey, and he was the new head of the CIA. Casey was sympathetic to the neoconservative view. And when he read the Terror Network book, he was convinced. He called a meeting of the CIA's Soviet analysts at their headquarters and told them to produce a report for the president that proved this hidden network existed. But the analysts told him this would be impossible because much of the information in the book came from black propaganda the CIA themselves had invented. <laughs> Perfect cell phone. <laughs> Nevertheless. <laughs> but it was all a fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> Their fantasy was just a fantasy. To smear the Soviet Union. They knew that the terror network didn't exist because they themselves had made it up. And when we looked through the book, we found very clear episodes where CIA black propaganda, uh, clandestine uh, information that was designed under a covert action plan to be planted in European uh, newspapers were picked up and put in this book. A lot of it was made up, right? It was made up out of whole cloth. You told him this? We told him that point blank. And we even had the operations people to tell Bill Casey this. I thought maybe this might have an impact, but all of us were dismissed. Casey had made up his mind. He knew the Soviets were involved in terrorism. So there was nothing we could tell him to disabuse him. Lies became reality. In the end, Casey found a university professor who described himself as a terror expert, and he produced a dossier. I mean, that, that, that is surely the meaning of madness, isn't it? Like the head of the CIA is literally telling you we made this up, and he's like, just, no, I'm not having it, I'm not having it. Just a reminder that Douglas Murray wrote a book called Neoconservatism, Why We Need It. 
But again, why was this guy um, appointed to the directorship of the CIA if he was like this? And why did he believe this stuff that went against the evidence of his own organization? These are like the, something had happened before Reagan got in, right? <laughs> These guys had got some kind of control over the institutions or several of them, yeah. some kind of hold over Reagan himself, some kind of hold over like who he appoints. Like, why was this guy appointed? <laughs> He sounds like he's terrible at the job. As you say, it was captured pr prior to this all happening. Yeah.